Hello, welcome all delegates. Once again, we are here with you for this monthly webinar we have been conducting between myself and Malik Arjun on behalf of Siddhivanai Ganpati Cancer Hospital Miras and Asian Institute of Neuronephrology. This has been an excellent journey so far. When we decided to do this program, we never wanted to focus on technology, but we wanted to look into the basic science and the philosophy and the art of treating urological cancers. We thought was taking a little bit of backseat lately. Everybody was focusing on technology. So we had five programs so far, four programs so far, and it's wonderful to have Dr. Ashish Kamath today to talk about intravascular therapy, past, present, and future. So what we are going to see today is a talk by Dr. Ashish Kamath, and thereafter we are going to have a wonderful case discussion. I'm just advancing my slides. Um, just a second. Um, left hand bottom. Left hand bottom. I'm trying to do Lower that. down. Yeah, just a second. Yeah, there you'll get it. Yeah, okay, yeah. fine. Yeah. Now, friends, uh, September 5, 2020, we all members of AUA, we got this letter from American Urological Association. And this was regarding global shortage of BCG. What the letter said that AUA has recommended several management approaches in the past about high quality care of non muscle invasive bladder cancer. These recommendations may supersede the guideline statements found in the diagnosis and treatment, which were jointly done by AU and ACU. Again, the recommendation was subject to the physician judgment. And I'm reading a few lines about this later we all received. The letter said, which was on 5th of September, the BCG should not be used in patients with low risk disease. The second statement was intravascular chemotherapy should be used as a first line option for intermediate risk of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. The third statement was, if the BCG would be administered as a second line therapy with intermediate risk of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, an alternative intravascular therapy should be used rather than BCG in the setting of BCG shortage. The another statement was, high grade T1 and CIS patient receiving induction therapy should be prioritized to use full strength of BCG if not available you can reduce the dose to half, one third if feasible. If the supply exists for maintenance therapy, it should be given for a year. In the event of BCG supply shortage, this maintenance therapy should not be given. And if the BCG is not available, we can use alternatives as gemcetabine, ipirubicin, docetaxel, valgubicin, mitomycin. And the last one, that the patients with a high risk disease if there are additional risk factors, and concomitant CIS, LVI, prostatic urethral involvement, variant histology, not willing to undergo further treatment, then subsequently initial radical cystectomy should be considered. And this was signed, just not by association, but it was just signed by ASU, DCAN, SEO. And this was something all the members got. Now there was another development just a month prior this was the highlight of NCCN virtual annual conference. And this suggested that there is addition of PEMBRO for the patients who are not responding to BCG. And then also efforts have been made to precisely define the BCG unresponsive disease. And this is what just a month ago, we have this information from NCCN that PEMBRO has been included for the BCG unresponsive disease. And also, there has been a little bit of confusion between which guidelines we should follow. Is the AUA, SEO, or whether we should be sort of going for EAU and is telling about the different risk stratification. Now, in the light of this background, myself and Malik Arjun, we thought we won't have any better person on the globe but Dr. Ashish Kamath, who can explain or clear this confusion and take us through the journey of the past the present and the future of intravascular therapy for the entire global audience. I'm sure everybody knows Dr. Ashish Kamath, but just as a mere formality, I'm going to tell you about Dr. Ashish Kamath. He's professor 
at md anderson cancer center houston usa he is also wine b dunnelston professor of cancer research a very coveted post at md anderson cancer center in houston he is director of md anderson euro oncology fellowship from 2005 to 2016 and a very popular program director if you see the list of fellows he has trained is mind boggling he has been nominated twice for the robert m chamberlain distinguished mentor award he is a graduate of aua leadership program and associate head and cancer center of reliance foundation hospital in mumbai and many of you would see this hospital how wonderful it is and the brain behind is all thinking and planning was dr ashish many of you know ashish graduated from mumbai and thereafter went to usa to do his residency and subsequently an excellent career in neurology he is expert in neurological oncology with emphasis on bladder cancer immunotherapy organ sparing and minimally invasive techniques he is involved in several multinational trials on bladder cancer he has written innumerable editorials book chapters and ashish i am still counting more than 288 publications 47 invited articles he is president of international bladder cancer group president of international bladder cancer network and i chair the bladder cancer think tank and i'm happy to be associated with for ibcn and ibcg he is listed in who's who in medicine and the best doctors in america and has won compassionate doctor award from patient groups he is member of aua guidelines panel for bladder cancer and he has chaired siu icu de consultations on bladder cancer in 2017 and is still a huge amount of sort of details on his cv 2017 Ashish, you might remember this picture in Goa. We had him, and we thought, you know, we will have a great conference. And the title of the conference was "Answering the Questions and Questioning the Answers," and it was a really great success. Ashish, wonderful to have you there, and thank you for coming at that time in Goa. And you see, in his event was style, actually, sort of, you know, conquered all the audience in Goa. I put in this picture because I am proud of both of you, Ashish, you and. mentor for many many people in india dr madhav kamath both are absolutely down to earth huge achievements in the life and i thought this picture speaks quite all this conference lori claus also joined us and you can see we are all sort of you know involved in sort of an interesting cases and probably it was mallikarjun who has put up some difficult cases so you can see the faces everybody was really concerned about it there you see dr mallikarjun there during this conference i had one session called as the buck stops at ashish kamar and for the viewers those who want to see this program it is on siu academy the huge number of problematic cases we put it across ashish ashish just sitting there quietly comfortably and answered all the questions and ashish it was a really memorable experience over the period of time we all mark myself badri ashish we have done a lot of courses in SIU and so many other platforms, and it has been a great, great experience. I must thank Ashish and Euro Today and Geo Onk. Recently, we did sort of patient case studies, and those who are interested, they can go on Euro Today website, and there are wonderful sort of case studies and interactions we had, and it is really good experience, and it was a good time, Ashish. And there are so many other sort of important meetings where we share our sort of information and knowledge at other places. Friends. we all remember you know people who have invented bcg morales we talked about mitomycin c it's all synonymous with max holloway we talked about donald lamb but i must say that over the period of time with his all 20 25 years of work on bcg one person across the globe who has taken the flag of the bladder cancer and bcg is ashish kamath who has taken huge lead and has relentlessly worked on that mind you when the corona came he has involved in sort of a role of bcg in seeing the immunity of corona so this was something a huge sort of in a work ashish is still doing with his colleague and this was none other than cnn he was on indian channels also barring arna goswami channel i suppose but i think most of the channels he was there friends it's a proud privilege and pleasure to have ashish and this is one of the very happy patients ashish has and ashish we are looking forward to have you here for this talk on past present and future all you are such um thank you so much makaran for that uh, overly kind uh, introduction um i'm i'm actually still blushing from all those compliments you gave me 
Um, it's always a privilege and a pleasure to join folks like yourselves. And I mean, it, it, it's, it's really my honor um, to join. Um, I'm gonna try and do justice to the subject in a short presentation. And then of course the question and answer part in the case discussion is always the most fun part. Um, I've started sharing my slides. Can you all see this? Okay, great. So, you know, the topic um, you asked me to talk about was intravesical therapy for non-Muslim invasive bladder cancer. What's in the past, what's in the present and what's in the future? And really, if you look at this, um, and you look at the evolution of therapy for urothelial cancer, bladder cancer, you can see that over the years, there's been a good amount of development and approval of drugs, but that's when it comes to metastatic bladder cancer. And as you all know, metastatic bladder cancer makes up about 20 to 25% of bladder cancer. So a large group of patients, 75% that have non-Muslim invasive bladder cancer were literally in some ways ignored because there were no drug development other than BCG, which was approved in the 1990s, and then valrubicin, which was approved again in 1990s, but not really used because of its poor efficacy. And then nothing was approved for bladder cancer in the non-Muslim invasive space. Um, I was fortunate enough to be at the FDA with Premalizumab early part of 2020 before COVID shut down the whole world. And Premalizumab was approved for non-Muslim invasive bladder cancer in January of this year. But again, it's not an intravesical agent. So as you mentioned, BCG really is the original immunotherapy. We sometimes forget, we see all these press releases and publications about systemic immuno-oncology and we get enthralled by that. But we have to recognize and remember that urologists really have been at the forefront of immunotherapy for cancer because BCG is something that we urologists use and it really till today is the best immuno-oncology agent with the most effective anti-tumor effect of all immunological agents, period. There's no question about that. And when there's no shortage, there's more than 1.2 million doses of BCG that are used globally for bladder cancer. And that's partly why we have a shortage because we need BCG and the companies either cannot or will not keep up production of this agent simply because in some cases it's considered to be ancient. It's old and there's not that much profit involved. But recognizing that, it's also important for me to spend some time and dispel some of the myths that go hand in hand with BCG so that people can relearn what many may have forgotten and some myths that need to be dispelled. So the first myth that I want to touch on is that people will say sometimes, well, BCG doesn't really reduce progression rates. All you're doing is reducing recurrence rates. And to them, I just wanna go back to this study. It was published now, gosh, 18 years ago, but it really remains one of the best meta-analyses of progression in BCG studies. And this was by Richard Sylvester, who many of you know, is the statistician for the European Association. And you can see here that in a meta-analysis of every randomized control trial, BCG does reduce progression. So not just recurrences, but progression. And I showed this as an old study, simply to let people know that don't forget what you knew. There have been numerous studies after this that show the same thing as well. The other question that sometimes comes up is, well, okay, I can use BCG, but I don't know how to use maintenance therapy. There's no real proven maintenance regimen that works. Again, that's just not true. This is the SWOG, SWOG, or six plus three, or the LAM protocol, where you give six weeks of BCG, then you wait six weeks, you give three weeks of BCG, you wait three months, give three weeks of BCG, and then BCG is done every six months for three years. This is the only protocol, as you can see, where maintenance BCG is better and adds over induction BCG. There are people who will try to do this, which is one installation of BCG every three months. This was a study that was done out of Memorial Sloan Kettering. Some people will try to do this, which is one installation every month. This was done out of WashU when Bill Catalona was there. And this is the most common mistake that urologists have made in the past. And Joe Polo showed this in his uh, Spanish study if you do BCG, then wait six months and do another six weeks of BCG, that really doesn't add anything over induction alone. So when people say, well, I've read a study where maintenance doesn't help, they're not being untrue. They've just read these studies and not the SWOG protocol, which has been replicated numerous times. And there's mechanistic rationale for this. If you look at a BCG naive person, you can see that as the induction goes on from week one to week six, there's a rise in cytokines. 
But once this patient has been exposed to BCG, the rise in cytokines peaks at about three weeks and it actually comes down. So more immunotherapy is not like more chemotherapy. It can actually be detrimental and suppress the immune system in some ways. The third myth, and this comes about a little bit because you mentioned this in the guidelines from BCG shortage, but one of the myths is that BCG does not work for low risk disease and it should only be used for high risk disease. Yes, when there is shortage, we should not use BCG for low risk patients because we have other alternatives. But in randomized studies, BCG has also shown to be much better in reducing deaths, metastatic disease, and of course, recurrence and progression in the intermediate risk category, which is the low grade tumor. So if you have BCG, use it in these patients. If you don't, of course, we can save it. And that's why there is some guidance from the International Bladder Cancer Group, because when you look at intermediate low risk patients that are low grade, not everybody needs BCG. And we've put forward four criteria. If a patient has multiple tumors, <clears throat> a tumor size large than three centimeters, early recurrences less than one year, or frequent recurrences, these are the patients that truly benefit from BCG. The rest can either get chemo intravesical chemotherapy, or if they have no risk factors, you can even observe these patients after TRBT because very few of these will ever have any adverse recurrence or progression events. Now, this is a common misperception, and I hear this a lot, where patients are stopped after a little bit of BCG or they don't even get recommended a maintenance course because the myth is that patients cannot tolerate a full course of BCG. This used to be true, in fact, in the original LAMP study, only about 16% of patients finished three years of BCG. But if you look at more recent studies, this is EORTC 30962, and then the international survey that the IBCG conducted, less than five to 10% of patients have to stop BCG for toxicity even at three years. So more than 90% of patients can finish a full three-year course of BCG. And what has changed over the time? Well, we urologists have gotten smarter. And this is just a summary that one of my former fellows that many of you know now is a professor at Stanford, Jay Shaw, uh, put together when he was at MD Anderson. And essentially, this is what we all recognize as common sense measures. Don't put BCG when there's visible hematuria. Make sure it's an atraumatic catheterization. Use statins and aspirin if you need to. Use antispasmodics. And giving one dose of a oral quinolone six hours after BCG does cut down on secondary infections. Now remember, this should be six hours after BCG because quinolones will otherwise kill the BCG as well if you tell the patient to take it before BCG or during the first six hours per se. Another common myth is that BCG will not work in older patients. And I, and I hear this a lot, uh, but again, summary randomized control studies show that BCG is better than chemotherapy, even in older patients. It's better from death due to bladder cancer and of course, progression and metastases. So BCG works even in older patients. And in fact, this brings me to the topic that Makar and you alluded to in, in studies that have been done in numerous parts of the world. And this is again, a very elegant study. You see that when BCG is administered to individuals, and then they are followed up with, in this example, yellow fever vaccine, they have an increased immune response to the vaccine itself. And because of this, you can see that death rates in countries, and even today, even though India has been inundated with a lot of cases, the death rates as a fraction of cases is lower in countries that have prior BCG exposure or a prevalent exposure to low dose of TB, BCG bacteria per se. And that led us, led us to the genesis of the uh, BCG as defense against SARS-CoV-2 um, study. This is a multi-center, multinational study. I put the link down there because I don't want to take up too much time, but feel free to look at this. There's a lot of good information um, about BCG and its effects on the immune system in, in the population in general. So if BCG is so great, why do we need alternatives? Well, we need alternatives because BCG does not work for everybody. About 30 to 40% of patients at two to three years will require some alternative to BCG. And of course, as was alluded to earlier, there is a shortage of BCG currently, which has been going on since 2014. Our group and many other groups have written multiple articles and editorials, and you saw the summary of that that was emailed to members of the AUA signed by the um, current president of the different organizations on there. So if you need alternatives, what are some of the alternatives? 
there has been an explosion in the agents that are available for BCG failure or unresponsive patients. And I can discuss that in the case discussion. Um, our group, the International Bladder Cancer Group, was at the forefront of developing guidelines that the FDA then adopted and has been now termed BCG unresponsive disease. And once those guidelines were adopted, there was an explosion of different clinical studies, different clinical trials. And I could spend you know, two hours talking about those. But briefly, you can look at the categories as being chemotherapy, either uh, intravesical as is or enhanced drug therapy, vaccines, gene therapy, immunotherapy such as permalizumab, targeted therapy, or of course you can use forms of radiation or other. And I'll just touch upon briefly a, a few of these that might be available or coming up to the forefront. So the first thing is valrubicin, and I bring this up because this is the only other agent that's known to be approved for um, these groups of patients. But you can see here that the response rates in BCG refractory patients is dismal. It was approved despite this dismal response rate of only 18% at six months and 4% at two years. And it was approved because there was nothing else available. And of course, the FDA at that time were trying to do something good for patients, but this drug is not used anymore. Hyperthermic mitomycin or gemcitabine or chemotherapy has been studied and used either before B BCG or, or after BCG, depending on if you have it available or not. And heated or enhanced chemotherapy does seem to have some benefit over standard chemotherapy because you're increasing the kill of the cells in the bladder. And because of that, many companies have come up with different ways to deliver chemotherapy in the bladder, either in an enhanced heated form or by complexing it to a gel that liquefies a, a body temperature, but is solid at other temperatures. And of course, Terrace is, is sort of a, like a stent that can be put in the bladder where you impregnate it with chemotherapy and it releases a compound over time. And in full disclosure, I'm, I'm involved in all these studies and advising uh, different groups on this. But really, I, it's important to recognize that currently, if you look at a meta-analysis looking at all hypothermic modalities of chemotherapy, the bottom line is that even though the method is promising, Currently, the evidence is limited and there are no high quality randomized trials. So clearly, if you don't have BCG or if there's a shortage, we will use one of these modalities, but it hasn't replaced BCG at least yet. A combination of chemotherapy is something that's more readily available. And this is something that when we don't have BCG, if there's a shortage or in patients who recurred after BCG has almost become standard of care in many centers in the United States. And this is a combination of gemcitabine and docetaxel. This is just a, a multi-center um, study that was put uh, together by a couple of our fellows. And you can see here that in close to 300 patients, when you use a combination of gemcitabine and docetaxel, the recurrence-free rate is about 65% at one year and 52% at two years, very high. And this is just shown here in a graphical format. At 24 months, if a patient had papillary-only disease, and had failed BCG therapy, their recurrence-free rate was close to 60%, it was 58%. And if they had CIS, which is the benchmark, and this is where the benchmark is usually at about 20 to 30%, here, this combination achieved a 50%, so almost twice the so-called benchmark at two years for recurrence-free survival. So this is an, a combination that is cheap, it's readily available, and patients tolerate this really quite well. Another promising technology uh, that, again, many of you might have had experience with because this has been around since 1990s, but the compound has actually been refined over the years. And the current photodynamic compound, Ritherin, is a lot more specific for bladder cancer cells. And there's a lot less need for patients to wear sunglasses and hats and cover their body once they get this drug and go out in the sun. And this is being studied at the University of Toronto. Uh, Girish Kulkarni, who is uh, one of the urologists there, is leading the study over there. And initial testing has good safety profile. It seems to work well with minimal toxicity in these patients. And again, this is something that is what urologists would be using uh, rather than systemic infusion or other drugs which have been currently studied and are more sort of in the medical oncology realm of things. Um, so with this, I just wanna say, of course, there's a lot more data. Uh, I didn't wanna take up all the time just with a lecture. And there's a recent publication that we put uh, out in European Urology Oncology just in June that actually summarizes um, 
pretty much every drug that's available in the BCG failure and the early refractory setting. And I put this link up here. And of course, my email that you all have, feel free to email me um, if you have any questions after we're done with today's uh, session. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashish. Um, it was a great talk, as expected. And uh, I thought, sort of, you know, we all should get sort of a clear idea, you know, how we stand today in terms of alternatives to the BCG. Now, um, I also welcome Dr. Kashyapi here. Dr. Kashyapi is a urological oncologist from Pune. Um, he is a Bombay Hospital product and has been excellent work for the last 15 years in China. Welcome, Dr. Kashyapi. Thank you. Is all all US now? You put up the cases and uh, we will discuss the case. I, I think you might be on mute, uh, Malika. Malik, you are mute. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. I think I think you have put it in a very nice perspective, the whole summary of what is being done now and uh, how we need to look at it in perspective regarding the use of BCG is concerned. We, have, we all have a feeling that we are, we are underutilizing BCG in some aspects and overutilizing BCG in some aspects, possibly not to be done in some aspects where it is being utilized and being done in some aspects where not to be utilized. That's what is happening because of a lack of uh, some sort of an understanding or a coordination into the whole proceeding. I'll put in some some uh, case material which for you across and possibly along with Makran and Kashyapi, we'll come to some conclusions in this. Possibly it involves some not only management of uh, intravesical therapy alone, management of CA bladder in particular, mostly NMABC only. So it is a 24 year male, no addictions, ECOG zero, and uh, uh, evaluated for painless hematuria, Clinically, no abnormality detected. CT scan shows a polypoid bladder growth with the posterior wall, 20 into 20 millimeters, and urine cytology is negative. And that is the growth there. I think you're able to see that? Okay. okay. Okay, next. So that's the cystoscopy. I just wanted to understand now. That's the cystoscopy. Now, the whole discussion happens regarding end block resection of the bladder tumors. What do you look at? Do you do it, uh, Makaran, uh, most of the time? Any end block dissection, uh, resections of the bladder tumor? Yeah, interestingly, I think as long as I'm able to retract the entire specimen through the sheet, because we use 26 sheets, sometimes we use 28 sheets. So, if you're able to deliver the entire specimen, I think it's worth doing it. But if you're not able to do it, it's a larger tumors. I think it defeats the purpose. So there have been a lot of studies which tell you the exact benefit of it. It's good for the pathologist. You can see the entire layer of the bladder lumen up to the muscle. So I think if you can retract the specimen well, you should go for it. How about you, uh, Kashyapi? Will you do it routinely? Uh, not routinely, sir. My experience with n block is limited, but I would be quite comfortable doing a regular TR between this and get a good specimen. Wonderful. I think you have been very, very curt in it. Ashish, what's your opinion on this? Let me ask you. There are two things which I have shown you here. One is an NBI. What is your opinion about this extra uh, maneuvers to detect the disease? And second thing is, what is your idea about doing an end block resection? Are we going to, what is your opinion on that? So, so let me address the um, uh, on block resection at first. You know, if you think about the oncological principles, which is to remove a tumor intact without disrupting it, spilling it, all of those things. Clearly, the way that we do resection for bladder tumor has lagged behind this oncological principle, right? And that's why on block resection has come up in popularity, but it's not just popularity, it actually makes sense. So if a tumor, as Makran said, is, is small enough that you can retract it through the sheet intact, I will almost always do on block resection. In fact, it's a good training tool for residents and fellows because it shows them how to actually look for the muscle fibers, get down to the base, etc. If the tumor is large enough that it has probably multifocality or it doesn't come out to the sheet, and again, you know, there are multiple devices that are being developed 
But currently, if you have to then morselate the tumor and take it out anyways, um, then the benefit of the on-block resection is lost in some ways. And in that case, we would resect the tumor and then do, in some ways, a uh, on-block type resection of the base of the tumor and get that out so the pathologist has that benefit. In respect to the... Sorry, go ahead. I, I, I was just going to answer the NBI question. Um, you know, I think that it, it's it, that question is similar to saying, would you want to watch a cricket match in high definition or standard definition or black and white? If you have the latest technology, optical enhanced technology, whether it's NBI or the stored um, system, you know, their right. modified uh, uh, spice system, which really hasn't been approved for bladder cancer, but it still is an enhanced system, uh, or the blue light system, if you have access to any of these, use it because it will clearly help you better than looking at something with the white light and the naked eye. However good we are, uh, you can use technology to make you be better. I have one more question. How do you, how do you assess the adequacy of resection here? How much is the depth of what you have reached? How do you assess? Because we see many techniques coming up. People inject saline under the base of the tumor and resect. In which case, if you're injected submucosally, you end up in going in the submucosa only. You don't go into the muscle. Actually speaking, <laughs> if you really need to inject, you have to inject into the muscle to get a little muscle lifted away. So how do you think, how do you think the oncological uh, principles can be served out this? No, I, that's that's a very good question and something that, you know, sometimes you want to uh, bring up when this is a live presentation at, at different stages, but you want to be kind to the presenter, so uh, <laughs> you, know, you don't ask those questions. <laughs> uh, the, the bottom line is uh, this, right? So we always have to consider, is anything we do actually going to change management and help our patients? In a patient where you have a reliable negative cytology and you suspect it's a low-grade tumor, and again, in most patients that are younger, like this patient, these tumors tend to be low grade. Of course, they can be high grade, which is why you want to check cytology and things like that. In these patients, you really don't need to go deep within the muscle because you don't need to you know, destroy the deeper layers. You don't need to go into the fat and do all of these things. So in those patients, I actually would say you assess the adequacy of resection by judging the tumor to see if it's low grade, using the cytology, and then you want to remove all the tumor that's visible or not with the blue light, but you don't have to really go deep, deep into the muscle. On the other hand, if it's a high grade tumor, which you can recognize visually, you know, if experienced people are, are right about 90% of the time, um, and cytology, which then helps clarify the others, in those patients, you clearly want to go deep enough till you actually see fat globules. So you see the muscle, and then I'll tell the trainees, okay, there's the muscle, now go deeper, right? And, and, and if it makes you uncomfortable, that's how deep you need to go. Um, otherwise, injecting the different layers of mucosa, that's good training tools, but it's not an all or none phenomenon. Perfect. I think you answered that question possibly. You have a high-grade tumor, beware that your depth of uh, resection might be varied if you do an end block or try to undo end block if you're not very well experienced with if at all you have a doubt, you better resect right up to see a fat globules transiently across a thin layer of uh, a perivesical tissue. That's exactly wonderful. I think if I take that as a real learning point today, and then I just have some, this was a, this was a end block resection which was done, and this was a histology which said non-invasive papillary urothelial carcinoma, low grade, no evidence of lamina propria and muscle. Smooth muscle bundles are seen which are uninvolved with this tumor. Are you happy with this sort of a biopsy or you want something more beyond this? Ashish? Um, no, I'm, I'm uh, happy. You used um, um, NBI, it looked like, and you got a good resection here. In younger patients like this, and I unfortunately have you know, too many patients who are in their teens and, and early 20s because I get referred a lot of these. Uh, fortunately, most of them do not recur. Um, and you monitor over the time. But the ones that do recur, for some reason or the other, all seem to be female, and they seem to be of childbearing age. So again, this is a male based on my experience and experience of others. This is someone that I would um, have done exactly what you did. You got a good resection, you looked with NBI, you did cytology. The one thing to consider is perioperative chemotherapy, you know, whether a single installation of chemotherapy might have been beneficial. But again, there's, there's evidence suggesting that if you used optical enhanced technology and made sure you saw everything else in the bladder was clear, then you could potentially avoid the potential toxicity of single dose chemotherapy and avoid it. So if you didn't do it in this patient, I wouldn't fret and I wouldn't necessarily bring him back for chemotherapy afterwards. 
Wonderful. Makran, do you do a routinely intravisical mitomycin or some sort of a chemotherapy irrespective of the tumor? Sure. I mean, I think it's the judgment as uh, Ashish has pointed out. In fact, there is a good paper um, uh, which uh, is trying to find out uh, by Harry Hur. And he looked at the judgment, how you endoscopically look at it and what's the sort of possibility, how, how much right you are. So an experienced sort of an, uh, a urological oncologist would tell you whether there is something like, you know, the guy who has uh, solid or a muscle invasive disease or a non-muscle invasive disease. If I am doubtful that there is strong suspicion of muscle invasive disease, I won't miss, waste sort of an intravascular therapy in this guy. On the extreme side, if you see this guy, you know, which is a very, very low grade or sometimes you get fun lump, I think probably it is an over treatment for intravascular therapy. So in between, I think I would say papillary tumors, you feel is sort of an intermediate or sort of a high grade Probably, I think intravascular uh, periocycle therapy uh, is going to be useful. Right. Let me let me have so end block laser resection of the urinary bladder tumor has been answered. Oncological outcomes have they changed or are they better or are they inferior to TURBT? Ashish, your frank opinion on this is it is it a is it a technology driven opinion or a definite difference which has happened after going on end block from a regular TURBT? Um, no, the bottom line is there's no difference in oncological outcomes between all block and regular TRBT if you match for the experience and quality of the two. Um, most of the series with all block resection that show benefit clearly take people that are experienced because they are the ones doing all block and they pit them against those that are non-experienced. And we must not forget, and in fact, this year during COVID, I've been fortunate enough to, to help different groups uh, lead efforts that the TRBT is the single most underappreciated oncological procedure that people do. And, and in fact, urologists will often relegate that to the junior person, not recognizing that that changes the management of bladder cancer tremendously. I mean, that makes a huge difference. Um, so it's really, really important to consider TRBT just as important as robotic prostatectomy. In fact, I would say that a TRBT saves more lives than a robotic prostatectomy, especially when you're doing it in these and sixes and sevens. But there's more surgeons. Yeah. <laughs> Very well said. <laughs> okay, let's go to the case two. Okay. It's a 50 year old male, diabetic hypertensive COG1, chronic smoker, evaluated for painless hematuria. You see a papillary lesion like the light posterior wall and a trigone measuring around 3 to 6, uh, 3 to 3.5 centimeters. And, uh, and uh, urinary ma malignant cytology was negative. And that's a cystoscopy finding. What you see now, that's the tumor, and that's the bladder neck. The large tumor, and that's the bladder neck. I would ask Kashyapi, how do you go about with this patient? Let me stop again here. How do you go about with this patient? Uh, the first thing would be there's a tumor coming at the bladder neck there. Yes. So I would first try to get that resected first. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is after the complete cystoscopy and assessing. Yes. I, I would start at the bladder neck first, and then that will give you more wider access to the tumor which is inside. Okay. I would also look at the mm -hmm. other area, and I would likely to do its prostatic urethral biopsies also in this. This tumor coming right at the bladder neck. So you want to do a prosthetic urethral biopsy yes, routine? In, it in, looks in, quite quite in, benign. in this patient. It's quite benign, low grade tumor. It appears to be, other than the size it, of the tumor. It, it may be inter intermediate grade. May not be a low grade. It looks multiple tumors. Mm -hmm. So now the CT has said two. I can two. see one small tumor. Yes. Uh, yes. So, perfect. So I would suggest. Uh, I would not really accept this as a uh, low grade tumor. It could mm -hmm. come as a high grade tumor. The other thing, what you see here is. If you look at the bladder neck, there's a tumor coming at the 12 o'clock also. So it mm -hmm. perhaps it's a bigger tumor than what uh, it's seen there. So you need a prostatic urethral bath. Yes. Sir. Mm -hmm. So that is perfect. And that is what is yes. being done. Okay. There are two baths is being taken sometime from right from bladder neck. I just want Makran to answer this now. Bakran, if you are taking a prostatic urethral biopsy, how do you take it? Do you want to take a, a blood the bladder neck or not? Or only, only just next to the verimantana? So I think first thing first, I think I would finish the TURBT first completely. I will do the TURBT, make sure it's completely adequately done. 
along with sort of you know whatever involvement of the bladder neck so that would tell me exactly sort of how much involvement it has in the bladder neck as well as sort of a deep muscle uh, into the bladder once i finish that resection then i exactly what you have done i can do the sort of biopsies tr biopsies of the prostatic urethra now a lot of people have said whether we could do sort of a cold cup biopsies but i don't think they are of much help because if there is a stromal infiltration you know we won't be able to see that so i will do exactly same thing but i will finish the turbt first complete resection take a deep muscle then subsequently take a prostatic urethral biopsy i want uh, uh, kashyap let, yes. let me know let me know will you do a tur in this guy trp I, i mean to say no i don't think a tur may be required in this guy sir you will not be requiring it no will not be required i would have had his prior history whether does he have an obstructive voiding symptoms also or is it only an hematuria I'm not because, bothered about the obstructive voiding symptoms. I'm talking about. Yeah, no, 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 I, I will not do a complete tumor in this. No. You just take two biopsies. Yes, that's all. Yes, but that is after complete resecting the tumor, as Doctor Kochigar said. Okay, Ashish, I think you got my question. What I was talking about. I think you got the question. Why I said TURP in case if it is necessary. What do Ashish tell me? So if you look at the data, um, if you need to do a TRP at the same time as a TRBT, once you've resected all the tumor and you wash it out, doing a TRP is actually safe um, because you would do that in someone where it, it is uh, indicated. Um, uh, in this patient, the one point I do want to make is that if you're truly worried about stromal invasion, and, and I'm, I wasn't based on the negative cytology, the, the imaging and all of that, I wasn't. Uh, but if you're truly worried about stromal imaging, then mm, the studies have shown that the only way to reliably pick up stromal invasion is to do a deep loop TURP, ideally at the four and five o'clock and, and seven and eight o'clock positions, because that's where the ducts penetrate the meat of the prostate the most. If you just do a little bit of a biopsy here and there, um, you will not pick up um, stromal invasion. And there have been old studies where people try transrectal biopsy, they tried a uh, cold cup biopsy and, and, and they then compare that to TRP biopsy. A TRP biopsy picked up the most number of tumors, but even then you missed about 30% of prostatic stromal involvement on patients who subsequently needed a radical cystectomy. So the thing to keep in mind, and I agree with everything that was said, is if you think that the prostatic involvement will change the management of the patient, that's the thing to always keep in mind. Will what I do affect the outcome of the patient or change my management? If this patient has low-grade disease that you think might be involving um, more than you can see, by all means do a biopsy. If you think the patient has stromal involvement and might need chemotherapy and a radical cystectomy, by all means do it. But if you think that this patient is going to get intravesical BCG anyways, um, then I don't think there's a reason to do a radical TRP because you're just causing potentially morbidity without any benefit. So that's exactly the point what I was asking about. In case, if you look at the future possibility of intravesical chemotherapy to manage the disease, leave alone, this is a very large volume, this is whatever it comes. Suppose, in case if there is a tumor of a two centimeters just at the bladder neck, and there is a possibility of you thinking about it, intravesical chemotherapy in sort any time in the in near future. Do you think about an incision of the bladder neck or a resection of the bladder neck or a TURP? That's one point which I just wanted you to answer. Malik, sorry. Yeah. Malik, sorry, sorry. I just wanted to say here um, two things. One is I think there was a different question. To another question you put it down there. What is the oncological safety of simultaneous TURP? And the EAA 2020 guidelines do suggest that it is pretty safe to do TUR. There is not much sort of a chance of implantation. That's a different question sort of, you know, altogether not related to this case. And uh, mind you, I think, there are people who actually do a TUR and TURBT together and subsequently given a BCG. And I have a handful number of patients who has developed tuberculous granular matter prostatitis in a residual prostate. Mm -hmm. So I'm not talking about this case as such, but safety wise, yes, EAU guidelines do suggest it is quite safe to do it. And the third point is, suppose patient has a muscle invasive disease and then you're going to contemplate radical cystoprostatectomy, then perhaps I won't be sort of on a subject in this patient for a TUR. So these are two or three different issues we talked just away from this case discussion. But mm -hmm. as you asked about the oncological efficacy of uh, TRBT, mm -hmm. sorry, sorry, Ashish. Mm -hmm. No, I, I was just going to say that um, unless somebody has a really tight bladder neck, um, there is no reason to do an incision or a resection of the bladder neck or prostatic urethra 
um, in the attempt, because people used to think you need to do that to allow the BCG to get in the prostatic urethra. Uh, we have to remember BCG is a attenuated bacteria. When you put it in the bladder, it causes inflammation, not just in the bladder, but also the prostate. In fact, I'm sure many of you in the audience have seen that when patients get BCG for bladder cancer, at some point they will have a nodule that you can palpate on the prostate. If you do imaging, you can see the subclinical granulomas in the prostate. So the bacteria gets into the prostatic urethra when the patient voids, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't need to do that unless there's a other reason to do a bladder neck incision or TRP. Is there any reason why you think about a bladder neck incision or anything for increasing the prostatic urethral contact in case if you want to do a intravesical chemotherapy in future? Um, hasn't been shown to be required unless you're doing it in order to facilitate the catheterization. Okay, okay. Makran, anything to add on this? No, no, no I think so. Fine, perfect. Okay. Let us go to the third case three. 58 year old male, no comorbidities, ECOG zero and painless hematuria on and off for one month. Urine cytology shows atypical cells, not malignant, atypical cells. Growth measuring around 2.5 to 1.9 millimeters on the left posterior wall of the bladder. And uh, that, is a, that, is a, that is a CT scan. That's a CT scan. And QRP was done and a single intravesical mitomycin was given in trop, uh, uh, immediate post-trop, that's, that's a tumor. I'm just showing. So it's a very small, I'm sorry to say that. I just wanted to see. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's a tumor. And you see a small, small, tiny papillary or frondy projections somewhere in the bladder here and there. Saw that? I think it was evident. Small ones, small ones, which is being touched. How do you consider them, Makran? Do you consider them as multiple? No, I think many times the experiences we have done sort of in a small study where we try to take them as biopsies, cold cup biopsies, because if you try and dissect it, I mean, the sort of thermal injury, they all get sort of, you know, pulgurated. Yes. Uh, so we took a cold cup biopsies, and you'll be surprised, many of them turned out to be just a papillary hypoplasia, and they were not able to even tell it's fun love or sort of in a low-grade uh, urothelial carcinoma. So many times you see these kind of papillary projection, just a papillary hyperplasia. But if you're in doubt, you don't need to take several separate biopsies, just pulgrate them and just uh, watch it again. If at all you want to, you can use an NBI uh, to rule out any you know, carcinoma and C2 along with that. But certainly that's been an experience. Biopsy proven, sometimes they're just a simple papillary hyperplasia rather than low grade TCC. Mm, that's it. Okay. This guy underwent a good TURP and some TRBT, and we had some muzzle also, good muzzle, amount of muzzle into it. And that is a, at the end of this section, you can see the transient areas there outside the bladder there. And then this is the histopathology. You see a papillary urothelial carcinoma of high grade, lamina propria invasion seen, and deep muzzle is free. Kashyapi, what will yes. be your next step in this patient? He's a young guy coming with a high grade disease. Detrus are present and positive and negative. Uh, Detrus are present negative. I'll still get him in for a rescopy or a re TURBT about four weeks time. Always? If yeah. you have done the TURP, TURBT? Yeah, that, that will also depend upon if I have done the TURBT and I feel I have resected completely a single yes. tumor here. I may choose to be very close, observe him. But uh, the, here, see, you have also seen to have done, but he's a young guy. So I would be more in favor not to miss out on any residual tumor there. How about you, Makran? Yeah, I mean, even if I've done it, <clears throat> if it's a high-grade young guy, lamina propria invasion is seen, and I think there is no harm in going back again to do a redo, to restage TURBT, because it is very well-known phenomena that is not only sort of vertical sort of an penetration you get, sometimes you get a tangential penetration which you might not have been able to assess in a post TURBT. Having said that, it was a good job done. But there is no harm done. I wouldn't know exactly what's happening. There can be upstaging. So I would certainly do a restage before I contemplate further treatment. Okay, Ashish. So it, when we write the guidelines, and in the guidelines, we essentially put that any patient that has T1 high grade disease should go back for a repeat resection in four to six weeks. Um, and in some guidelines, we actually even put if they have any high grade disease, including TA, they should go back for a second look uh, in four to six weeks. 
But we remember when we put that in the guidelines, we're putting it in because we're uh, essentially writing the guidelines for people that may not be taking care of bladder cancer patients all the time and might not be doing such an export resection such as you have done. So um, if someone had TA disease and you did a good resection, you can ignore the guidelines. I mean, I can say that here. With T1 disease, it's a little bit different. So if NBI, blue light, et cetera, had been used in this patient and you'd done the resection and you had looked at the other lesions and seen if they were CIS or not, um, then you would actually be having a discussion with the patient in the office saying, well, you're relatively young, it's T1 high grade with CIS, um, do you want a radical cystectomy or do you want to try BCG? And if the patient says, I want the radical cystectomy, which many patients will, you know, more than you would be uh, expecting would opt for, then you don't need to do a repeat TUR. But sure. if you are contemplating doing bladder sparing therapy, then I think looking in a second time and potentially doing a repeat TUR helps in two ways. Number one, as, as uh, was uh, discussed um, by um, all three of you really, it's to see if you miss something. But again, in experienced hands like yourself, I doubt that you missed anything. So the more important reason to look in again in about four to six weeks is to make sure that this is not one of those T1 high grade tumors that is a rapid grower. Because if this one grows again, and again, you have new tumor in other parts of the bladder or in the same field in as early as four to six weeks, then we know that those are the patients that have a poor, poor response to BCG. 80% will actually not respond to BCG. So even if you're confident in your quality of resection, a look and potentially another TRBT is beneficial for that reason. How about, how about do you think, believe in that substaging the T1 disease and uh, that will be deciding when to do a TUR, DTUR, BTUR, something like that? Uh, you know, the substaging that you're referring to is based on the depth of the tumor into the lamina propria. Some people will do it by millimeters. Some people will do it based on the muscularis mucosa into A, B, and C. Um, the problem with that is unless you have a phenomenal pathologist, uh, these are not reproducible. They're not reliable and reproducible across different centers and places. So um, I really, and I've shown a slide many times, and many of you people may have seen this. If you look at the mortality of a patient with T1 high-grade disease, it's the same as a Gleason 10 prostate cancer, PSA 75, P3B. And in that patient with prostate cancer, you would not say, oh, it's only superficial prostate cancer. Why don't we just monitor your watch, right? So why do we do that for T1 high-grade disease? It's because there's a misnomer in our minds that it's superficial cancer. It's not. T1 disease is invasive. It just hasn't gotten into the muscle yet. But too many patients even today in 2020 die of T1 high-grade bladder cancer. We should, we should really consider this an invasive, aggressive cancer. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish. I think, I think we under, he underwent a repeat TURBT after three weeks. And that is how the thing looks like at the end. And that's the bladder. And you see a slough there. And we resect it again. That's a resection again happening in the same base. Let me pass forward that. And that is the real section which has happened. And that red part also has been taken out. Most of the time, it is mistaken as a C and C2, but in a redo situation, it doesn't appear to be so. So that was the thing which was really resected. And now, few mus smooth muscle bundles with a force of benign prostatic tissue, negative for malignancy. There are two bottles. One is the prostatic empty you also was taken. If, if the second URB shows residual tissue with a focal muscle invasion, what will be your appropriate? Do you still consider this patient for a bladder preservation by any chance, Ashish? No, 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 no. Not, 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 not unless they, for some reason, refused. Uh, but even then, no, uh, because once it's in the muscle, your risk of dying from metastatic disease, even if it's a small tumor, is forty percent. Um, and yes, we can get away in some select situations if the patient's extremely old, extremely sick. Or in the U.S., sometimes for religious reasons, patients are not able to have their organs taken out. Then yes, you consider them to be early T2 disease, and you treat them appropriately with either partial if it's amenable, or you can you know do close monitoring, or you can do radiation or what have you. Uh, but most of these patients, once it's in the muscle, are a setup for uh, metastatic disease 
if they live long enough. So in this patient, and I forget the age, but I think it was 50-ish or so. Yeah, 50. If, if the patient will live, you know, at least another 20, 25, 30 years. Um, it's it's not really something that I would recommend unless the patient just gives me no choice. How about you, Makara? Yeah, I entirely agree with Ashish. I think there is one more chance of getting better. There is a sort of a you know, window of the opportunity here. And basically, you should not miss that. I still remember there is a very good old paper by Stockel, and it says cystectomy often too late. And we all have seen in our practices that the temptation is to counsel the people and say, okay, see, we have this intravascular therapy with us. And whosoever wants to, you know, when we talk about these sort of you know, options in T1, G3, people say, okay, you know, we can preserve our bladder, but preserving bladder at what cost? You know, if it is going to be at your cost of your life, I think it's not worth doing it. And this young guy, your prosthetic urethral biopsies are negative. So you can actually sort of do a new bladder in this guy also doing bladder substitute. Excellent quality of life. On top of that, there is also evidence to suggest that the final histology set is PT0. No notes. These patients have an excellent outcome. No adjuvant therapy. So you will have a wonderful cure and you are avoiding sort of, you know, uh, uh, this or you are sort of you know not taking this with the both hands and you should grab with both hands this opportunity and cure this guy. Okay, let's go to the next case. 50, 47 year old male, chronic smoker, tobacco chewer even now, known case of a bladder tumor, underwent TURBT in 2014, 2017. Histopathology is not clear, patient not received any adjuvant intravesical therapy later, defaulted for further cystoscopies and follow-up. Now we present with multiple frondy lesions involving all walls of the bladder, largest being 6 into 5 into 5.7 centimeters in the anterior wall, a large tumor which is existing in the thing. So that was the cystoscopy of the anterior bladder wall tumor, large tumor. Kashibi, what's your inference on that, the way it looks? This is a recurrent multifocal tumor, likely to be a muscle invasive, but Looking at his history, prior history, not a regular follow-up, my threshold for offering a more radical treatment here. So the way you look at it itself. Do you think yeah. that previously it was a low-grade tumor, he survived 10 years with resections happening. Do you think a similar disease happening now? Or do you think there is a shift in the way the tumor is behaving nowadays? His history is about six years. Yeah. There is likely to be a change in the grade. This It could have been a low-grade tumor to begin with, but now it's a multiple tumor perhaps involving most of the anterior wall, there is, there is likely to be an upgrade in the uh, grade of the tumor, very likely. But I feel he should be better offered an earlier, uh, a more radical treatment like a cystectomy. See, is it the tumor volume which is making you to think in that or it's going to be the recurrence pattern which is going to think in that or a possible higher grade of the lesion which is going to be there? Which all, one is driving all, you for that decision? All, all, all three, sir. All three. Focal, yes, sir. Multifocal, large Multifocal, tumor. Multifocal, large tumors, upstaging of the grade, likely to be a muscle invasive. It could be focal. You may not be able to reach the base really. If sure. you try to reach the base, you're likely to perforate. It's more on the anterior wall. And, sure. and moreover, he's, he's been unreliable in a follow-up. So okay. that is my threshold, sir. Oh, wonderful. Bankran, how about it? Yeah, I think what you said is makes a sense. This guy is irregular on follow-up. Even though it looks like a low grade, the entire bladder, almost 70, 80 percent of the bladder is sort of involved with tumors. So, question is whether we are offering sort of you know, too much aggressive treatment for a low grade non-muscle invasive disease. But if you look at the indications, if it is multifocal, recurrent, you know, even non-muscle invasive sort of you know, lesions, I think these are the candidates for a radical cystectomy sooner than later. They are not as aggressive as what you would say, like a T1 G3, as we discussed about it. One more thing in this patient, these patients have a tendency to develop multiple recurrences in the urethra. So I have done cystectomies for large multifocal low-grade tumors for a, for a number of reasons as such. And subsequently, the incidence of urethral malignancies in these patients, multifocal disease, is fairly high. So I think no harm in sort of thinking of radical cystectomy. But what I would certainly do is try and complete my resection and see you know, how much sort of an I can get it to the base. Uh, make sure exactly I get the proper histology, but probably that's probably the long-term fit. Ashish, let me ask you two questions now. One is, how do you manage this guy getting up to the muzzle, getting the muzzle? How do you think? Is it the way, correct way to think about? Second point, what is your threshold of getting a cystectomy in a low-grade disease? 
So, you know, this is a, a very um, complex uh, decision making for this patient. And, and unfortunately, I see a, a lot of these sorts of patients referred to me. Um, I think we have to, number one, consider, was this patient actually not good at following up or was he just not seeing a good urologist, right? Because if it's not the patient's fault, then I don't think we should necessarily make a treatment decision based on his lack of follow-up, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at this patient, let's assume he came in first time. Let's, let's ignore the follow-up issue. Mm -hmm. And you have multiple tumors like this. Cytology is negative. You look in and you think it is low grade. This is a patient in whom I would potentially consider staged resection. I would resect as much as I can to send it off to pathology to see if it's high grade. And if it comes back high grade, because of all the reasons that Kashapi and, and uh, Makran mentioned, I would then counsel this patient on a radical cystectomy because we might miss a focus of muscle innovation. It's multiple large volumes. These tumors can go uh, into the you know, ureters, into the prostate, et cetera, et cetera. So radical cystectomy for high grade tumor, even if it's TA, large volume like this is completely justified. If it's a low grade tumor on pathology, cytology and everything, and I've done a stage resection, then I would actually tell this patient that we should go back in and resect all the tumor because um, well, for a low-grade tumor, that's not the patient's fault. You know, maybe they didn't have good follow-up with their urologist. I would not necessarily push them to a radical cystectomy. Once in a while, you see patients that have tumor all over the bladder, and they're all low-grade, and I've done this stage thing. In those patients, instead of going back for TRBT because they still have a lot of tumor in the bladder, I will actually use chemoablation. Um, and again, this is sort of like, you know, using intravesical myomycin. Uh, I currently use a combination of gemcitabine and docetaxel for six weeks and then wait six weeks and then go and do a repeat resection because I, I want to use everything I have at my disposal and chemoablation will then help the repeat TUR focus on those tumors that have not been ablated by the chemotherapy. Um, so if it's low grade tumor, I would try to save the patient's bladder. If it's high grade tumor, it doesn't matter if it's only TA because of all the reasons that you mentioned, uh, multifocality, large volume, anterior wall, et cetera, I would push the patient for radical cystectomy. Perfect, I think you answered the chemoablation part, which was once upon a time was quite common, but nowadays it lacked possibly because the people have become quite experts in doing a TUR and do it in two stages. So that's the reason why the once upon a time, when I was a resident, it was happening at that point of time, but we don't know. Do you believe in chemo ablating with a BCG in any times? Uh, no, no, no. BCG no, no. is not chemotherapy. It doesn't work as an ablation. The only place where you will treat a tumor with BCG is CIS. And then it's not the BCG, it's the immune system that's treating the CIS. That's it. So this patient Tien, turned out to be a non-invasive papillary carcinomas, and we discussed enough regarding the uh, intravesical therapeutic agent. Do you think, suppose if this guy has got this sort of a report with a low grade, low myeloma, proper invasion, no muscle invasion, what sort of a chemo, intravesical chemotherapy you plan if at all you teach him? Or you just follow it up? Ashish. Okay. Um, so, you know, in... in, in, in my, I'm, I'm stuttering because my response is a little bit different in the U.S. than what I would recommend. In the U.S., we have gone away from using mitomycin simply because mitomycin is now made in, by, by one manufacturer, even though it's generic, and the cost is prohibitive. Um, and that's why most of us have switched to gemcitabine or a combination of gemcitabine and docetaxel if you really have large volume tumor. But in countries and places where you have mitomycin, where it's uh, readily available and it's not $1,000 per dose, um, I would actually still recommend using mitomycin. Uh, just make sure that the concentration is 40 milligram in 20 because it's the two to one ratio that's most important rather than the absolute dose. So if you use 20 in 20, it's not good. 40 in 40 is also not as good. It's 40 in 20 cc's. Getting that two to one concentration is key. Um, if you suspect that the patient's allergic to mitomycin or will develop you know, calcifications, et cetera, because they have keloidal tendencies, then don't use mitomycin. You can use anything else. Most of the chemotherapies have similar results if you compare them. There's not that much different between all of them. Do you differ in any fashion? No, I think I agree exactly what he said. Um, the only question is, I just wanted to ask uh, Ashish, um, are these patients now you'll be tempted to use gemcitabine and docetaxel kind of uh, therapy in these guys? That's what he uh, said. Yes, yes, because because even the combination of gemcitabine and docetaxel is a better because combination chemo always works better. You know, we don't use single chemo anywhere else, so why use it in the bladder? But B, surprisingly, the combination is cheaper than mitomycin and currently in the U.S. So you're using okay. a better 
combo that's cheaper because again don't get me started on the price gauging that occurs <laughs> yeah. but, you know ashish just i just wanted to for the, for the for the benefit of uh, the indian sort of delegates here since we discussed a couple of years ago i started using gemcitabine and docetaxel in my patients in some group can you just elaborate what's your way of doing it i mean just as dose in your protocol i mean you send them home put the catheter or not can you just explain the guys sure sure um, so, you know, again, this was a cocktail that was uh, developed um, initially by Michael O'Donnell and then adopted by many of us. And now, you know, we have multi-center experience and it's changed over the years as to how you administer it. So the current regimen and, and what we use and what is standard, essentially patient comes in just like they normally would for intravascular chemotherapy. Uh, you catheterize the bladder, empty the bladder and first put in the gemcitabine. And we use one gram and 50 ml. And again, it's that one to 50 ratio. Some people use two grams in a hundred ml, but the one to 50 ratio is sufficient. It's left in the bladder of the patient for about 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, and because we're gonna recat, you know, redose the patient, we do sometimes leave the, uh, the catheter in unless the patient just cannot tolerate having the balloon in place, in which case we, we deflate it and take it out. Um, but for the most part, the protocol is to leave the catheter in for about 60, 90 minutes, empty the bladder, then instill um, docetaxel, and the concentration there is 37.5 in 50 ml. And once you put the docetaxel in, we take out the catheter, and the first time the patient gets it, they're asked to hang around and, and wait. But after that, they can leave, go get something to eat, and then they come back in, again, 60 to 90 minutes, and then the bladder is emptied in the office in you know, a controlled fashion, unless we know that they have a high residual volume, in which case they're emptied with a catheter, per se. So it takes a good you know, three-ish hours out of the day of the patient. Um, and this is repeated once a week for six to eight weeks, depending on how long the induction is. In patients that develop a, a lot of irritation of the bladder, that usually occurs because of the acidity that comes in from the gemcitabine. In those patients, we have them pre-medicate with uh, bicarbonate uh, the night before and the morning off, with the usual caveats if a patient has CHF or any reason where you don't want to salt load them, of course we shouldn't do that. But most of the side effects that occur or because of the acidity that occurs because of the gemcitabine and its diluent, and giving them bicarbonate in the bladder usually takes care of most of it. Yeah, perfect. I think this is extremely important because there are a lot of permutation and combinations. If you try and Google and find out what the doses are, I'm sure there is enough amount of material. The delegates, you have a wonderful first-hand information and a practical information. But the only thing is, as I said to you, that uh, a lot of people need to spend about three, three and a half hours, uh, unlike BCG, which is just about, well, time is about 60 minutes, some people do it for 90 minutes. But that's perfect, Ashish. Thank you for that. Pakran, just go on looking at the chat box if there are any questions. Yes. Okay. There, were two, there were two questions, I think, pertaining okay? to this. Okay. And the question was basically, I think Ashish has partly answered, what is the residual tumor recurrence rate? I mean, what are the chances that you will pick up sort of a residual disease in T1G3? And you mentioned in the range of 40 to 60 percent, probably. That is one question. And the other question is whether you would do a CT IV on this guy, Malikarjun, uh, with such a high multifocal disease, whether you will do a CT IV you, to make a decision whether you would like to continue with URBT or probably go with cystectomy. And I suppose the answer would be yes. Get a CT scan done. If it shows the indirect evidence of hydronephrosis, possible small lymph nodes, then probably you may take a call rather than waiting for too long. I think Ashish's point was very well taken there. You do a biopsy, whatever you can resect, resect. If it is a high grade, forget about the rest of the things and go ahead for the cystectomy. If it is a low grade, do a stage resection and complete the job and take a call on that. That needs to be the thing. I think, uh, I think Ashish, you had a question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I asked. wanted to ask Ashish, in this patient, instead of a chemotherapy, would you consider a BCG? Looking at your initial criteria of a multifocal, more than three centimeters tumor, recurrent tumors. Um, uh, I would as an adjuvant, but not uh, for chemoablation. No, not for chemoablation, as an adjuvant after the complete resection. Yes, absolutely. Because if you resect this patient completely yeah. and this patient falls in the uh, more than three criteria for the intermediate risk tumor, yes. um, all the data shows that BCG is better than chemotherapy. That being said, if you don't have BCG, which there's a shortage in the US and many parts of, of Europe, um, we tend to save BCG for those that are risk of progression. This patient unit multiple tumors is at a risk of recurrence, not progression. So we try to save BCG for those that will die 
of their cancer from progression rather than have multiple TRBTs. But if you have BCG, like I know you do in India, then absolutely immunotherapy with BCG would be better than be chemotherapy. Better than. Oh, Wonderful. You. This guy had a tax cystoscopy three months later, and that was a scar of the previous resection. And you see a tumor like this. You had intravesical mitomycin for six weeks. And this is at the end of three months, you have a cystoscopy. It's been fulgurated. It looks low grade fulgurated. Do you make any definite decision here or you just need to follow it up and anything more than this? Makaran? Yeah, I think just need to follow it up. It's a low grade disease. I think you had completed his mitomycin therapy. Looks like a single lesion, looks like low grade. Do you take it as a failure? I would say it's a failure. See, basically, you have finished his intravascular therapy as a single small lesion. And see, if you look at the natural history of multifocal, low-grade, intermediate, or high-grade disease, they're bound to get recurrences. What the intravascular therapy is trying to do is to reduce the frequency of recurrences and chance of progression. So if you have reduced frequency of recurrence, I think you probably have achieved what you wanted to, not entirely completely. But I won't label this as a failure as such. Uh, 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 Ashish, will you look at a change in the drug or any maintenance schedules in these patients? Uh, you know, I think you need to consider this patient as a success, right? Because they had he had so many tumors and now we have this one small lesion. Uh, no chemotherapy is going to be 100%. So if this patient is tolerating mitomycin well at this point, at this early stage with that one small thing that you've ulcerated, I would not necessarily think that there's a reason to switch. Obviously, if this patient continues to have recurrences, um, then I would either switch the chemotherapy to combination or go to BCG as, as we discussed. What's your threshold regarding recurrent tumors? Every three months, you see a small tumor like this forever for the next two years. Will it be an indication for something else? Um, so uh, there's a built-in question to your question. And um, one of those is, I want to answer even though you're going to ask it, is do you have to resect or fulgurate every low-grade recurrence? And the answer is no. Uh, if you know that a patient has had low-grade tumors and you know from the history of the patient that, okay, this is again a low-grade tumor, um, some of these single low-grade tumors, you can watch, you can do active surveillance. So you, I, I would maybe watch it and then see if the tumor stays stable. Some of these will stay stable for six, nine months and I don't okay. have to do anything. Exactly. Um, or I can just cauterize in the office itself without going to the operating room. So if that happens, um, then no, I just watch these tumors. But if these tumors keep growing and they're multiple, et cetera, et cetera, then yes, then you know that's your trigger for going off this modified active surveillance and then actually going on to resection and treatment and changing drugs and things like that. Thank you, thank you. Let us go to the next case. 57-year-old uh, female, no comorbidities, ECOG-1, left radical nephrovirotectomy and a bladder cuff fixation on paper as it has been done, what has been said for upper tract urethelial carcinoma somewhere in 2015. And she underwent a TURBT for bladder tumor in August 2019, following which it was a high grade disease. She had a six cycle induction cycles of intravisical BCG with 80 milligrams because she was just 40 kilos or 50 kilos she'd said. Ashish, I have got a question here. How were the dose? There's a lot of confusion which happens regarding dosage of BCG. And the, and the response with the dosage of the PCG. You answered a little part of it in your previous lectures and this lecture. I just want to question, because I said 80 milligrams here, what do you mean by the true dose for the, of the PCG? So um, that's a question I get all the time. And yep. it really depends upon our understanding of what is BCG, right? Because when you look at chemotherapy, you have doses, milligrams per kilogram, you have concentrations, et cetera. When you look at BCG, we talk about milligrams uh, or we talk about vials, but what exactly is BCG? BCG is a bacteria. So how do you actually measure bacteria? You measure them based on colony forming units. And the amount of colony forming units that is present in a vial of BCG varies from country to country, manufacturer to manufacturer. And unfortunately, even with the same manufacturer from month to month, there's a variation of a hundredfold um, in the colony forming units in batch to batch of Merck's BCG in the US. So if you keep in mind roughly 10 million colony forming units, that seems to be what is required to generate the immune response in most patients. Some need a little bit less, some may need a little bit more. So depending on what the CFU is, and I presume with 80 milligrams, you're looking at about 100 uh, million CFUs uh, with the dose that you have. With the Indian population being having this exposure to BCG, et cetera, et cetera, that should be more than enough 
And if the patient starts developing toxicity, you can go to half dose, one third dose, even one tenth dose. Because keep in mind, if there's a variation of a hundredfold, one tenth of a hundred is still more than what the variation might be, right? Because a lot of people go, oh, one tenth is too little. It's not depending, and I don't have that on my slide, but there's a whole um, a paper that we published that one of my fellows looked at. You can go down by a hundredfold BCG and have the same actual concentration as another batch of BCG um, picked up from a different supplier. Did that answer? Malik, I think you have gone, I think there's some problem uh, with the connection with Malik. I think it answered your question. The, the other question is, Ashish, uh, uh, people talk about uh, this SWOT study and other study, and you briefly mentioned, and even the AUA later just recently said, even a one-third dose is good enough. You made your point amply clear. But uh, we have been doing one-third dose, and it's fairly effective as such. So, so much sort of talk about this uh, BCG toxicity. Uh, I think uh, we lost the screen as such, but let me just carry on. Uh, so do you think, I mean, one third dose, I mean, I, have you adopted to one third dose or you still would like to try first a standard dose and if not, then go for one third dose? Um, so if, at times when we have BCG shortage, uh, because we can give three patients, yeah, you know, the dose, if we spread up a while for one third, we've started doing one third dose as standard uh, for the patient. But if we had enough BCG, I would still recommend starting out with a full dose BCG at least in the Caucasian patient experience, because they have not been exposed to BCG before, they don't have any vaccination, they don't have the exposure. So in those patients, um, a full dose of BCG is um, better for induction. If you look at the study that actually compared full dose BCG versus one third dose BCG, and then looked at one year versus three years, um, the best results were found with full dose BCG for three years and the worst results were found with one third BCG for one year, but there wasn't so much of a difference that the patient is actually being harmed. They're just getting a little more recurrences, but not more progression. So it's still safe, perfectly acceptable to do one third BCG if you don't have a choice, but if you have a choice, it's better to do full dose BCG. And then you can drop the dose based on toxicity, tolerance, other things. Okay. Sorry, sorry, hey, I just got off, I'm sorry. Okay. No, 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 something went wrong. Something that you got. I uh, just sharing my screen. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, I thought I scared you with my response. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Absolutely. Yeah. I just, I just thought. Uh, while he's sharing the screen, uh, I should just uh, keep the discussion going. Now, this lady who had sort of an FRA urethrectomy, uh, obviously, we know that patients who have a high grade upper tract urethral carcinoma high chance of failing into the bladder, almost around 30 to 40 times of chance that. Now, are these patients, you know, you would make a quick decision of sort of going to be more aggressive on this because they're bound to sort of recur and fail. And every time you look at it, they keep on coming down with the muscle invasive disease. So are you going to be really aggressive approach right from the beginning? Or uh, what, what's your approach in this guy? Just, I mean, PRBG and then just wait and see. Yeah, no, those are good points. So if you think of urothelium, you know, as everyone knows the urethelium is in the bladder, the ureters, the kidney, the prostate in men, urethra and prostate in women. So the tumor that arises in the bladder tends to be more often than the upper tract simply because of the law of averages, right? There's more surface area in the bladder, they tend to occur quicker. But when you have a tumor in the upper tract, it, it is almost, you have to consider these, despite all the gene expression profiling and all the others that suggest that it might be more FGFR3 in the upper tract than the bladder, et cetera, et cetera take that with a huge grain of salt because sampling, as you know, in upper tract tumors is, is, is always problematic because of the size. So the bottom line is if you have upper tract tumor, these patients are at a high risk for occurrences everywhere in the urothelial tract. And the bladder happens to be the most common place where they occur, which is why studies have shown, and now it's standard, that at the time of nephrotractomy, you should instill chemotherapy in the bladder and that is the same principle as trying to avoid spillage. However well you clamp the ureter, you take care, um, the recurrence rate in the bladder is higher if you haven't given intravesical chemotherapy after or during the nephroeurotractomy or after within the first day or two. Yep. Now, once you get the pathology in the upper tract, if it's a high-grade tumor with CIS, again, just based on law of averages, these patients are gonna recur in the bladder. It's like you resected the tumor in the bladder 
and you came up with T1 high grade with CIS, but then you ignore the BCG. So in those patients, I actually follow them up with BCG in the bladder to decrease recurrences. Um, if these patients recur in the bladder, they are at higher risk for a lot of adverse events, but it's not based on the bladder tumor being more aggressive. It's just based on the fact that these patients' tumors or urothelium in general is more susceptible to tumors developing and being more aggressive. And just quickly before, sort of, you know, I think Malik is still getting, Malik is getting No, no, I'm, I'm in, I'm in. Right, right okay, uh, fine. Uh, so suppose this lady has undergone nephroureterectomy and she needs a cystectomy. Obviously for nephroureterectomy, one would have done sort of clear the retropral lymph nodes as well as the pelvic lymph nodes, plus a cuff of the bladder with intravascular portion. So when you go back in for cystectomy, you know, do you find it a little bit sort of difficult or is there a lymph node violation or plain violation, technical difficulty, some tips and tricks? Um, you know, uh, I, I always say if it's easy, anybody could do it, right? So, <laughs> I mean, it, these these are the cases and surgeries that we all do all the time. Um, the bottom line is to always recognize what was done before, find a normal plane, and then go in there. So I just did, you know, two of the, exactly the scenarios that you're talking about this week. Um, and they don't take longer than three hours uh, if you know how to do those, right? So, I mean, obviously if it's a right side of nephro, you start out on the left side, create the yeah. plane, and then sure. come over to the right, um, et cetera, et cetera. But the other point I want to make since you brought it up is that uh, you'd be amazed at the number of times that I will see someone that's had a nephro U and then come for a cystectomy and not a single lymph node was taken out anywhere. And if you haven't looked at the pathology report and you don't know that they didn't do a single lymph node dissection, you might sometimes yeah. not uh, recognize the need to do a complete lymph yeah. node dissection um, yeah. and, and that should be done per se. Yeah. Um, again, since you brought up cystectomy and, and you know the audience is here, I've stopped doing robotic cystectomies. I've gone back to doing them completely open uh, uh, again. Um, I mean, that's not because I think that robotic cystectomy is, is um, not good in good hands, but there's no benefit, and, and that's why I've gone back to doing it open. Malik, are you listening? Yeah, yeah, I'm. I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he told me that last time itself, because I commented on that short talks on three talks, and he said last time itself when I went oh, yeah. to it, exactly. Oh, no, okay. I, I, I do agree on that, but anyway, letting, you're getting my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this patient had you. You have that idea that she had a. Uh, uh, she had a. Uh, sorry, uh, this was intravesical BCG therapy with 80 milligrams, and we had a discussion about what is the dose, and it was very clearly made uh, uh, clear by Ashish at the point of time, which I think was blast, and that's the reason why my computer shut off at that point. Which I don't. <laughs> anyway, she presented with the to the R place at that time with a severe irritative voiding, and we said it is a. BCG toxicity or whatever related to BCG. It never settled with initial symptomatic treatment. She had a cystoscopy which showed a diffuse congested bladder with 150 ml capacity. No evidence of recurrent bladder lesions, but it was so red you could not identify anything. How do you go about at this point of time, Ashish? We all see these patients now and then. I just wanted to you to answer these questions. Um, so, you know, obviously here the consideration becomes um, we have to treat the potential tumor or the risk of recurrence of the tumor, and we have to treat the patient and the patient's symptoms. Um, if the patient has severe irritating voiding symptoms, at this point, it could be for two things, two reasons. Most likely in this patient, it's, it's related to BCG and BCG-related uh, cystitis. It's not because of CIS, because again, based on the tumor characteristics, et cetera. But I would still do what you know you suggested, which is just do a biopsy, make sure it's not CIS that's causing the irritating voiding symptoms, but that's most likely to be negative. If it's confirmed to be cystitis, which in this case uh, you could suspect based on the clinical parameters, we have to treat the cystitis. So obviously hold the BCG, don't do BCG at this point. Um, and honestly, a, a relatively short course of about three to four weeks of a quinolone antibiotics takes care of most of the subclinical BCG infections that we see. We don't have to do INH or fanfan, all of that in, in this day and age. For the symptoms per se, once you've covered the patient for either BCG uh, infection or for secondary UTIs per se, and the quinolone will do both of those unless you have resistant bacteria in your particular hospital or center, then symptomatic treatment, and if symptomatic treatment doesn't control these patients, then a short course of steroids does wonders. 
because most of the reaction is that whole Th1, Th2 immune balance or imbalance, so to speak, and a short tapered course of steroid. And in the US, we, we use the steroid dose pack, which is used for patients you know, that get that. Um, I don't know the what it's called in India or anything, but it's a quick, um, literally 14 days. You start at high dose and the patient themselves have that pack and they use it at home and they taper off to zero. Um, that will relieve severe, severe symptoms in 95 percent of, of cases okay i see this all this been has been tried it's already four months now post bcg and this lady continues to have irritative symptoms will this be a point of threshold where you start in our uh, next we would have not stop and started steroids i think it's not a routine practice to start steroids in india probably but do you think that this patient requires an uh, antitubercles now or arsenic and nifampicin at this point of time um no, I mean, again, it would depend upon whether you have an AFB stain, whether you have active cultures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the use of anti-TB medication, I mean, there used to be a lot of uh, use and it's been sort of not again in a randomized fashion been shown in, in a lot of series that most of these side effects are um, managed with tincture of time. And what happens is because you start anti-COC, anti-TB medication and say, we're gonna do three to six months, and then in three to six months, three to six months time has elapsed, you attribute the success to the therapy, but it was time that, that actually helped, number one. So using steroids can really shorten that time. And, and I would um, really recommend that you try that on your patients and you would be amazed with how quickly they do well. Now, obviously you have to be careful with diabetes and all of that. You know, If it's a patient that has a lot of other comorbidities, then you don't wanna do just more than the short course. But some patients, once they finish a short course of, of steroids, they will come back and say, oh, I feel normal, but now that I've stopped the steroids, um, getting symptoms again. And then we put them in a lower dose of steroids for a month or even two months. If they have a lot of comorbidities, obviously we involve the uh, endocrinologist and, and other people uh, to make sure that we're not causing any secondary uh, problems. problems. Wonderful. Makran, do you routinely anytime use steroids so often? I usually what not. Is... Yeah, I usually not. I think uh, many times uh, we have done. What other thing I do in these patients too, urine cytology in these guys. Negative. Is, yeah, it is nice, it's negative and then perhaps uh, put them sort of on a short course of AKT without any steroids and they do fairly well. And if it's really, really required, it's still not sitting down. You can order a small dose of steroid. But as she said, make sure then uh, the diabetes doesn't get there. And other yes, Kashibi, when what is your threshold when you start your uh, anti tuberculosis treatment? Can I can I ask a quick question, uh, oh. uh, Kashibi? You can answer yes. this. Um, yeah, is there a lot of uh, quinolone resistant uh, BCG or BCG strains in in India? Is that why you have to start anti TB medication? Because I'm not aware, so I don't want to leave the audience with the misconception. In the US, we don't need anti-TB medication that often because the BCG is very susceptible to quinolone. But in India, if there's a difference in the susceptibility, then again, I don't want to miss, uh, misspeak or, or guide people the wrong way. Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. Quinolones are used very rampantly in India without any rhyme or reason. So there is a very likely chance uh, it, they may not respond to quinolones, one. The routine practice of giving quinolone, say, as you suggested, six hours post BCG is not very commonly followed here. Steroids, yes, I use. My threshold for starting AKT is, again, not a very low threshold. I would wait. As you said, it's the time you need to keep on reassuring them. Their main worry many times of these patients is it a recurrent cancer. So if you tell them perhaps there is no recurrence, you give some time, give anticholinergic, reduce the water intake, perhaps that helps them. Maybe I have used anti-COPS in maybe one or two patients over the last 15 years. Okay. The present thing happened was it started on rifampicin and isoniazide with a low-dose steroid, continues to suffer with the symptomatology, voiding quantity once in 15 minutes, and their capacity has come to somewhere around 80 to 90 ml. And CTIV shows a thickened bladder wall, small bladder capacity, no suspicious bladder or right upper urinary tract lesions. And that is a that is a uh, X-rays of the uh, the CT scan of the uh, of the of the patient. And now what? Now what? Cytology is negative, and you have got a small contracted bladder, high frequency. Makran? Yeah, I mean, just I think while you were all you know of the screen that we discussed about the chance of sort of what is the fate of this bladder in upper tract urethral carcinoma of such a high grade nature. Now, which is failed within four or four years of upper tract urethral carcinoma. 
Now, in my experience, I think in these patients, you know, it's such a small contracted bladder, obviously the chance of getting further disease is very high. Her quality of life is bad. I would be tempted to counsel her on the line, see, look, whether you would be a candidate for a cystectomy, early cystectomy, and see whether we can bail you out of this situation. Mind you, there are people who would say, okay, why not do an augmentation cystoplasty and see what happens because there is no evidence of disease as such. Mm -hmm. And I tell you why. I have n number of patients who have undergone augmentation cystoplasty and reimplantation. And when they fail, they come back and do a cystectomy, and this guy is completely nightmare. You know, upstaging, you know, the leak and fistulas and everything. So I think you need to spend enough time with this lady, discuss pros and cons about it. And if she is ready, you can go ahead and do a cystectomy and finish the job once and for all because she is a high candidate. You know, for failing into the into the bladder, especially with the upper tract urethral carcinoma, I would do emergency cystoplasty. Ashish, you'll agree on that. Um, you know, again, um, I, I do, I, I I do agree, but I think that in these situations, um, based on the history of the patient, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you have to be very careful when you're doing the augmentation cystoplasty to make sure that um, everything is negative, because otherwise you're creating a alternative channel for the tumor to spread if it recurs. Because once you have the bladder connected to the bowel mesentery, um, then all bets are off as far as uh, you know the, the spread. And, and once this patient recurs, they could develop metastatic disease really, really quickly, even with CIS in the bladder uh, without going to T2 disease. So you definitely need to do, I see your question, random biopsies and, and make sure the bladder is clear before you do any augmentation cystoplasty. So you answered that question, but what surprised us was we did a cystoscopy for that sort of a plan. And thinking that we may think about an augmentation cystoplasty because she was insisting that she doesn't want to lose her bladder. And that was uh, one area. And suddenly we see a small dimple there. And then let me, let me fast forward. Ah, that's a small dimple, which was nothing but a, a previous ureter. And there is a tumor in that ureter. So there was no cuff that was taken out the first time. Yes, exactly. So and and we made small... point. Uh, I think we made this point while you were off. I was telling. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <the> quality <laughs> exactly. of previous surgery. You know, sometimes we have no idea what they did or didn't do, yes. so we have to always keep that in mind. Yes. So that was the thing. We resected that, and we still see a small stump of the ureter, which was not resected probably, or the previous resection was happened at the point of the pre uh, ureteric orifice. So the ureter got stenosed, and there was a small stump which was left behind, which was never could be picked up. And that is a tumor which came out at the time and we did a resection and it turned out to be, sorry. No. Ah. Tumor invasive, uh, so this is a, this is a, this is a she underwent a radical cystectomy versus and the previous, first, the first biopsy was this, sorry. Non-invasive papillary real carcinoma of the low grade TCC at that time but we convinced her saying that this bladder cannot sustain and there is a tumor already. So she underwent a radical cystectomy versus the excision of the distal system with the bladder cuff, uh, uh, which, which was there uh, along the thing. And, the, uh, uh, and then it turned out to be a little higher grade tumor with a deep muscle propria, tumor in which deep muscle propria outer half of that area of the ureter. So with this sort of a thing, uh, I would say uh, whenever, whenever we do, uh, 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 whenever we did a, a radical um, um, uh, the upper tract cancer tumor, how, when you think about the bladder curve, what is that definition? What you want to give for the youngsters to learn when they think about a bladder curve for uh, upper uh, tract urethral carcinoma? What do you mean by the bladder curve, literally? Right. So. Um... I, I think the principle for um, any of the younger people listening is that you have to follow principles of oncology. And when you are considering principles of oncology, you need to keep in mind that you need a margin. When you keep the margin in mind, the whole um, notion of the bladder cuff makes a lot more sense. Because if you look in the bladder during a cystoscopy and ureteroscopy, you clearly know that the ureter doesn't just come out at one hole. It's not a two-dimensional structure. It's a three-dimensional structure. It comes in, it fans out, you have the urethral sheath. So when you're thinking about the bladder cuff, you need to make sure that you're actually taking out a margin. It doesn't have to be a large margin, but a margin around the ureteric orifice where it goes in the bladder, the intramural portion, et cetera, et cetera. And there've been many people who have said, oh, I just plucked the ureter out and everything's okay and things like that. But then exactly what you showed happens. 
doesn't happen often enough simply for the reason that upper tract tumors are not that common. And because upper tract tumors are not that common, we don't see this that often in most people's practices. Of course, we will see it in ours, but many people don't ever see this. So they assume it, it, it's okay to do it. So I think we have to just remember oncologic principles, remove the entire ureter with the sheath in a small area of the bladder mucosa or around that, however you do it. Some people do a hybrid intra extra vesicle. Some people do it all extra vesicle. I think done well, there's no real difference between the different techniques. Um, but the notion of not doing it, uh, it should only be mentioned to be condemned. Wonderful. We have a, we have a doctor who had an upper tract tumor who underwent a nephroeurotractomy and following which he had a high grade tumor and then he, under, he had a BCG and then he had a recurrence for which he had a radical cystectomy. That's a point which we have discussed. But we had a, we, her, his own daughter came back because father underwent a radical cystectomy and all. He came back, she came back with a, a just a routine checkup and found to have a bladder tumor at that point of time. How often you see this familial bladder tumors or a genetic predisposition? Um, we see this fairly coffin, uh, commonly, and it's not a genetic predisposition necessarily. It, it tends to cluster in groups of people that are exposed to the same uh, toxins, right? So in, in many places, it's, it's people drinking the same well water, uh, but can have arsenic if you go to Taiwan or, or Chile or some parts of America. Uh, or patients who are exposed to family smoking. So uh, for that reason, it tends to cluster in families, but it's not a true genetic predisposition unless you're looking at HNPCC or Lynch syndrome, which is different. It's more upper tract, colon cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the answer to that question is yes. Anytime somebody in the family has bladder cancer, if the siblings or uh, daughters or whoever were exposed to the same toxins, um, they will have the same risk factors, but it's not a genetic predisposition per se. Okay, so she underwent a, a resection of the tumor there with a biopsy and then uh, with, a, with a muscle, et cetera. And this was turned out to be a high-grade papillary urothelial neoplasm. No evidence of invasion into the lamina propria. Deep muscles in section provided. We did a complete resection with this and the huge muscle right up to the base has been resected. And we took it at our cells. And so we know that a significant amount of muscle has been resected at the end. And so... So she received after that, as we discussed, though it was necessary, but in some rare, some cases, this is one of those cases where we've done a fantastic dissection, we are sure about it. So we said intravesical BCG, 80 milligrams, developed irritative voiding and defaulted the maintenance schedule after four doses and left later. She never came back because the symptomatology was significant. One year later, she visited the hospital, no symptoms, no abnormality, checks hysteroscopy, no recurrence. What is your opinion on maintenance? Is there any maintenance necessary now? Do you think that is it we have treated her at all or not? Ashish. Uh, you have treated her. And, and you know, uh, like, like I showed earlier, uh, maintenance therapy does help over induction therapy. Um, and if this patient has no symptoms right now, and it's 12 months since the last BCG therapy, and you want to watch her and see if she has a recurrence and then restart the BCG with maintenance, that's a very, very valid option. Um, on the other hand, if she had T1 high grade disease, I would say start the maintenance right now itself, but don't take the chance. But with TA, uh, she's had a good response for a while. It's perfectly reasonable to watch this patient. And if she recurs, pick it up early, resect it, and then restart the BCG. Okay, suppose she has completed what you would have put her on a maintenance schedule, right? She would have been continued on a maintenance schedule. Actually speaking, uh, that, that sort of been the ideal way of managing the case. Suppose she misses this maintenance in a fashion after a year, it doesn't matter whether you institute the schedule again at, at that point of the time. That's what you, you, you said in your talk uh, just in the evening. Am I right? Um, yes, yes and no. It, it depends upon um, what you expect the patient's um, immune status to be. Usually after a six week course of induction BCG, when a patient goes up to 12 months or so, um, they seem to have the response similar to those that have had BCG more recently. But once they get about 18 months or beyond that, then the immune system has gone back down the Th1, Th2 balance, and then you have to redose these patients. So yes, for a year, you should be okay with, with continuing on, but if it's beyond that, then you have to sometimes reinduce these patients. I just want to have one question answered. What is the role of BCG in patients who are on ATT? I had one of the cases because of the lack of time. I don't want to discuss the whole case. One point answer. What is, suppose if the guy is already on antidote plus treatment, what is the role of BCG in those patients? 
Um, to be honest with you, none, because if the patient has AKT going on and you give BCG, you're going to kill the bacteria before it gets in. So you will have some response from the dead uh, cell wall of the BCG. And again, there was an entity called MCC, uh, which was created from a dead bacteria completely. But you won't get much effect um, if the patient's on active anti-BCG therapy. Um, so in those patients, it'd be better to do a combination chemo than try BCG. This is one of those patients who had a, a, a variant histology like nested variant. What do you think? Well, where intravesical therapy can be there? You said about micropapillary in your slides. Is there any role of intravesical therapy at all in a vari variant histology? Um, it, it depends. Um, so in a nested variant, if you're sure that it's a low-grade nested variant, um, that's one thing. But most nested variants don't respond quite as well. Um, it's not the same as just having a low grade focus in the deeper layers. And in those patients, um, remember, when it comes to T1 high grade bladder cancer, I always want to emphasize to the audience that that's a dangerous disease. And if the tumor is showing you that it has even other features that suggest that it's even more aggressive than an already aggressive cancer, um, you're not helping your patient by letting them make the wrong decision and try to save the bladder. So most of these patients would actually truly benefit from early cystectomy. If you have no choice, then of course you try BCG. And if it doesn't work, you know, at least you counsel the patient appropriately. I've got a last case. I'll take one minute in this case. A 55-year-old male and evaluated for painless hematuria, bladder tumor, three into three centimeters, posterior lateral wall of the bladder, and that's a tumor here. I think nice tumor there, resected, and everything is done very well. The thing is, oh, sorry. This is the resection which has happened, okay? And the histology comes as, it's a low, in, it's a suggestion of invasive papillary urothelial uh, cancer, but low grade. It's one of those things which have been rated into the intermediate risk categories. How do you, how do you treat these guys? So this is, is very, very, very uncommon. Um, and anytime you see this, whether it's at uh, our center uh, here at MD Anderson or at your center, you should always have the pathologist get a second opinion either from their own colleague or from some other place, because this is so rare that more often than not, they will find a high grade focus along with the invasive component that completely changes your management. Um, if it's T1 low grade, assuming that you have just missed or the pathologist has missed or somebody has missed it. These are patients that even though they fall in the intermediate risk category, according to the AUA classification, um, I would treat them with BCG uh, and because the, the downside of missing a focus um, and these tumors recurring underneath in the deeper layers is catastrophic for many patients. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ashish. I think we've just passed crossed around five, 10 minutes beyond the time. It was wonderful. It was so nice that uh, I wish I, could, I have another five cases. I don't mind putting it across, but it's too much of a time. I think it's too much of a, everybody get intravesical chemotherapy now itself. <laughs> thank you very much. Makran, it's all to you. And I thank Bal Chandra Kashyapi you. for your consent. I just put you on. And Makran, yourself, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Ashish. Sorry we bumped into your time. Uh, I know sort of you have been sort of a back to back meeting throughout. I was worried whether we are pushing you into for another, coming into your sort of another meeting, but wonderful as usual. And uh, viewers, you all know the buck stops with Ashish Kamath. I mean, he will answer you each and everything there. And honestly speaking, Ashish, I think uh, this has been eye opener for the younger guys. Um, just I had a message from Dr. Venugopal saying that all the cobweb is entirely clear. So I think you had one of the best compliments you had. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, and I'm sure we will have you on this sort of now show once again. Uh, all the best to you, and uh, thank you all the viewers. Thank, thank you, Ashish. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Always good to thank see you. you. Take care. Bye bye.